Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie, and this is episode number 732 for October 14th, 2018. Coming up in just a few minutes. Hopefully, we'll be able to see uh, this wonderful new label that, uh, that we have here. And there it is, Old Forester 1910, and that back does say Old Fine Whiskey. Old Fine Whiskey. Old Forester released the final bourbon in its Whiskey Rose series this week. The 1910 Old Fine Whiskey edition marks the brand's return to downtown Louisville's Whiskey Row with the opening of the Old Forester Distillery this summer. On the site of Brown Foreman's offices during the decades leading up to Prohibition. I toured the distillery recently as they were bottling that new whiskey, and we'll take you through the Old Forester Distillery later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. That's coming up later, along with the calendar of events, the What I'm Tasting This Week department, and much more, all on this edition of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast, brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no red breast. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch makers, creating the bold and complex flavour of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. Sotheby's was hoping for a new world record Saturday when it put a bottle of the 1926 McAllen 60-year-old with a label by Sir Peter Blake on the auction block in New York City. However, the winning bid came in at $843,200. That's more than a quarter of a million dollars short of the world record set last week at Bonham's in Edinburgh. That leaves the 1926 McAllen 60-year-old bottle with a label by Italian artist Valerio Adami still holding the record, which has already been certified by Guinness World Records. The next crack at the world record comes next month in London, where Christie's will auction yet another 1926 60-year-old McAllen. This one is a -a one-of-a-kind bottle, with a hand-painted label by Irish artist Michael Dillon. The U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to hear a case that could affect the way states regulate wine and spirits sales, especially the thorny question of how states regulate shipments from outside their borders. A 2005 Supreme Court ruling allowing wineries to ship between states had historically been interpreted to allow retailers to ship to out-of-state customers as well but challenges to that interpretation are part of the reason FedEx and UPS no longer allow retailers to ship to most states. The specific appeal comes from a lawsuit in Tennessee where the owners of Maryland-based Total Wine and Spirits are challenging a state law that limits liquor store licenses to state residents. The case will likely be heard in next year's Supreme Court session. Back at the end of 2016, during episode 620, we heard about a project at Harriet Watt University to restore the European flat oyster population in Scotland's Dornoch Firth in cooperation with Glenmorangie. The oyster beds near Glenmorangie's distillery in Tain were wiped out by overfishing more than 100 years ago, but a test project last year showed the habitat was ready to be repopulated. Now. 20,000 oysters are being moved to the reefs in the Dornoch Firth, with plans to expand that population in the coming years. The distillery has added new equipment to remove almost all of the hazardous materials in the wastewater that it pumps into the Firth, but the barley-based waste material will be allowed to flow, since it actually provides food for the oysters. Details now on new whiskeys. Angel's Envy is out with its 2018 Cask Strength annual release. As always, this one is finished in port wine barrels and is bottled at 62% ABV. 
It'll sell for around $200 a bottle. I received a sample the other day, and I'll have my tasting notes for it soon at whiskeycast.com. Colorado's Distillery 291 is releasing its latest batch of 291 Bad Guy Colorado Bourbon. It's bottled at 60.6% ABV and is distilled from a mash bill of corn, malted white wheat, malted rye, and beechwood smoked malted barley. Less than 600 bottles will be available in Colorado. No word on pricing. The Virginia Distillers Company has released its second Brewer's Batch Blended Malt. This one is a partnership with Three Stars Brewing in Washington, D.C., which used the distillery's barrels to age its ale, then sent the barrels back to the distillery for finishing its blend of Scotch whiskeys and its own single malt. It'll be available in the District of Columbia, Maryland, and at the distillery's shop in Lovingston, Virginia, for around $65 each. And finally, if you're looking for a deal on whiskey, or maybe just an empty bourbon barrel, and who isn't these days, Ohio's State Liquor Board has a deal for you. They have set up a closeout store at a former grocery store in Columbus to clear out inventories of wines and spirits that have been discontinued in the state-controlled retail system. For instance, Art Begg's Oriverdi's bottling from 2014 will be on sale for about $55 a bottle. The Balveni 17-year-old peated cask will sell for $69.50. Compass Boxes, this is not a luxury whiskey from several years ago, will be available for $166 a bottle. The Four Roses Al Young 50th Anniversary will sell for $150 a bottle. Gordon and McPhail's Mortlock 15 will be available for $46.50. And Japan's Hibiki 12 will be available for $80 each. There are also at least two editions of Parker's Heritage Collection whiskeys, a signatory bottling of Glenbergie's single malt, and several editions of the Woodford Reserve Masters Collection on the list. This coming Sunday, October 21st, and on Sunday the 28th, they'll also be holding drawings for free whiskey barrels. Of course, the barrels are empty. The Liquor Board is also offering a raffle for the chance to buy W.L. Weller 12-year-old bourbon for $28 a bottle the next two weekends, and High West's Yippee Kaye bourbon on the final weekend for $99.95 a bottle. Of course, that's while all the supplies last. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney's single malt with Viking Soul. Heading out on a voyage of your own soon? Look for Highland Park's new travel retail lineup at the airport before you board your flight. It includes the new travel edition of the classic Highland Park 18-year-old. Find out more at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. I'll be in Columbia, South Carolina this Thursday night for the Great American Whiskey Festival. A few tickets are still available, and I hope to see you there. Tickets are also on sale now for the New Brunswick Spirits Festival, November 13th through the 17th in Fredericton, New Brunswick. I'll be leading a whiskey and photography tasting during the festival. And just a heads up, I'll be back in Victoria, British Columbia in January for the annual Victoria Whiskey Festival. I am mentioning it now because there's a change in the usual schedule for ticket sales. If you're coming in from out of town, combination hotel and ticket packages at the Hotel Grand Pacific will be available starting on Friday, November 2nd with ticket-only sales starting a week later than usual on November 10th. You'll find details at the festival's website. Meanwhile, the Ultimate Art Bag Escape Tour continues this week in New York City. The Walking Whiskey Wellness Conference is this coming weekend in Aviemore, Scotland, along with Woodford Reserve's final Bourbon Academy Class of the Year in Versailles, Kentucky. Elixir in San Francisco celebrates Whiskey Week next week with special tastings each night from the 22nd through the 26th. Whiskey Live Los Angeles is on October 25th. 
The Manchester Whiskey Festival is on the 26th and 27th in Manchester, England. Whiskey Live Johannesburg is October 31st through November 2nd in South Africa. And Whiskey Fest San Francisco is on November 2nd. Right now, we have 176 different events around the world on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a festival, tasting, or other whiskey-related event coming up, just use the contact form on our website to let us know about it, and we'll add it to the list. This is Whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch Whiskey. From this place, and these places in that place... These are the people that make it. This is what they sound like. Because you're a cheeky wee blighter. Dance like. I like that. This is what they do all day. Building the great character of Johnny Walker Black Label. Aging hippie and oak for 12 long years. Thanks. Oh, it's gorgeous there. Oh. What is character? It's giving a damn. You're all right, lassie. Which looks like this. As much as this. See, the land that shapes these people... And the people that shape this whiskey all shape how bloody good it tastes. Not the bloody game in the telly, Alan. A whiskey as bold as it is complex. For every step you take, this is Johnny Walker Black Label, friends. Step right up. Cut, cut. Can I drink this now? Johnny Walker Black Label Blended Scotch Whiskey. 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. From 1882 until the start of Prohibition in 1919, Brown Foreman's main office was located at 117 West Main Street on Louisville's Whiskey Row. In the decades that followed, other businesses set up shop in that space, but eventually the building was pretty much abandoned, as were others along that same block. Members of the Brown family and their partners bought up much of that block a few years ago and started redeveloping Whiskey Row, preserving the original historic facades of those buildings while bringing them up to current standards. Right now, there's still a lot of construction on that block, which will soon have two new hotels, shops, restaurants, and apartments, and already has a distillery. This summer, Brown Foreman opened the Old Forester Distillery on the site of its old pre-Prohibition offices, giving one of the oldest bourbon brands around its first real home after 147 years. As I mentioned during the news, Old Forester released the final edition in its Whiskey Row series this week to celebrate the opening of the distillery. I was there last month when it was being bottled, and took a tour of the place with senior tour guide, William Hogg. So this thing's been open since June, yeah. and let's sort of go through it. We're looking right now at this display of uh, not only the contemporary lineup, but vintage bottles as yeah. well as uh, some portraits of uh, George, George Garvin Brown. George himself. Yeah, I know. So this is our, our little wall of history. Um, we have bottles uh, from all the way back in uh, 1890. Uh, is the one on the, the far left there, hand-blown glass. You can see it's a little crooked, um, so we're not 100% sure if it was made at, uh, early on a Monday morning or late on that Friday afternoon. Um, we also have some uh, excellent uh, decanters from uh, Raymond Lowy. Uh, we have an entire exhibit upstairs because um, we were the, the first ones to do holiday decanters, so it's something that we always like to, to show off. We have a wonderful picture of our first distillery, the Madeline Distillery, um, taken around 1901. Uh, and then some uh, uh, prescriptions during Prohibition, uh, where we were able to sell during Prohibition. So we always like to show off the, the old prescription for Old Forester. I'm looking at this book with an inscription attributed to George Garvin Brown, who died in 1917, right around the time that Prohibition took effect, didn't he? And uh, the title of this book is the Holy Bible repudiates prohibition. What's that all about? Yes, so the book was written in 1910, and George had some very, very strong feelings about prohibition. Always put it in quotes because he refused to give it credence. And this entire uh, book was he was taking scripture verses that were supporting, you know, the use of alcohol um, in the Bible, uh, both Old Testament and New Testament. And he just wrote an entire book with all the verses in it uh, that was supporting it. So it was a, it was a very um, 
nice during the time because this is the prohibition movement so the temperance movement was using a lot of bible verses to condemn alcohol and he took so much offense behind that um so he wrote this entire book so a lot of people you know it might be the uh, the first book on bourbon <laughs> mike veach might have some issues with might, that might but some, yeah, yeah yeah so we're going down a set of steps here and tell me while we're going down these steps what this building was before this was pretty much ruins about three or four years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, so um, it was all, uh, we had to gut, gut it all. The only thing that's really original is the, the facade. Burnt down as well again. Um, we had a fire five years ago-ish and set us back about eight months uh, on construction. Um, before that, it was just kind of an empty husk. Um, but we were actually here from 1882 to 1919. So this is truly a homecoming for us, uh, 100 years in the making. We're very, very excited to be back on Whiskey Row. Um, to be back sharing the, the story that is Old Forester. And the building did not stay in the Brown family's ownership that entire time, did it? No, not the entire time. We were able to get it back um, probably seven years ago. Um, we, set, we sat on it for a little bit of time just trying to figure out what we were going to do in here, and then we finally decided the distillery to make a home place for Old Forester. Which never really had a home place because you got that big water tower out on Dixie Highway at the big Brown Foreman distillery, and we know Woodford Reserve has its home place out in Versailles. But Old Forester, which is what started the company, never really had a home place, did it? No, so we, we never had a place where we could actually take the public and give you know, a nice tour. Um, you know, We always, as you said, the water tower. Um, the, the fun story with that one was when they were first building uh, what essentially would become our campus, they spent all the money on the building itself. They had no room for advertisements. So the guy who was in charge of the advertisement said, well, can you at least paint the water tower like the bottom? And they did. And we've addressed this before with uh, Chris Morris, but uh, Old Forester is not named, obviously, for George Garvin Brown. It's named for Dr. Forrester, Dr. right? Forrester. Yes, so Dr. Forrester, um, two, two R's in the middle uh, instead of just the single R. So back in 1870, when George is creating this brand, he wanted a name that people trusted. Um, and there was a physician uh, here in Louisville. He was um, a surgeon in the Union Army uh, during the Civil War, comes back to Louisville, um, starts his practice there, very trusted man. Um, and George approaches him. He was already one of his clients because George is a pharmacy school salesperson. And asks, you know, can I use your name? And Dr. Forrester was very... Um, gracious and, and use, letting us use that. Uh, and then around 1890s, somewhere in the 1890s, um, Dr. Forrester retires. And we uh, decided to, instead of um, going on and continuing with the double R, we, we dropped the R, um, gave him some money, uh, and we, we changed Old Forrester uh, to what it is known today. Do any of his descendants still have any uh, interest in the whiskey, at least, or have you heard from any of them? I uh, personally, no. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if anybody else has. Uh, we, we've not had any foresters. To, we've had some foresters show up for tours um, that say that, oh, yeah, we're probably related, but not 100% sure on that one. We're in the fermentation room, and there's actually a tour going on next to the fermenters, so we're going to be kind of quiet here, but this is actually a working distillery, right? Yeah, we are a full-functioning distillery. We're going to be doing about 14 barrels um, a day during production distilling. Um, we have our fermentation tanks are uh, 4,500 gallons. We don't cook mash on site. That is the only thing that we actually don't do here at the distillery. Um, we get our mash delivered from our uh, main Shively facility, which is about 15 minutes down the road. Um, and it comes here, and uh, we will have the whole entire fermentation process until it, we get to that distiller's beer um, and usually we have some in here. Um, right now, I think we've, we've distilled everything out, so we actually have just a bunch of empty fermenters. Um, but when you, when you are in here and it's full, you have that wonderful, wonderful, rich aroma uh, of the fermentation process that, you know, it's, it's so great. And we're recording this on a Friday, and I'm imagining that by Monday morning these fermenters will be full again, right? We're hoping so. We're hoping so. So usually when we get done with fermentation, we head up on our Willy Wonka-style glass elevator. And what's really nice about it is, is that our gift shop, there's frosted glass. So when you first come in, you don't actually see the still. And it's this wonderful big reveal uh, when you go up this beautiful glass elevator and you see our 44-foot tall Vendome copper still uh, in all its glory. Um, so it's a really, really nice one. But we're not going to get the big reveal. We're going up the freight elevator. <laughs> we're going to go up the back way. You may hear the forklift in the back picking up 
packages of Old Forester because you're bottling here too, right? We are. We are currently um, bottling the last of the Whiskey Rose series that's uh, coming out pretty soon uh, that we're very, very excited to, uh, to get uh, into people's hands. Uh, what can you tell me about that one, or can you tell me anything about it yet? Uh, last I remember it was the 1910, 1917, uh, 1920, something like that. Am I off on those years a little bit? Oh, there's some years in there. There's, and, and as all our Whiskey Row, there's always you know a, a year that goes into it, because that's what our Whiskey Row series is all about, is telling these wonderful stories uh, in each expression, and all leading up to what would be the Old Forester uh, home place here on Whiskey Row. Um, now that we are here, this is going to be the last rendition. Um, but I think we're looking for a press release sometime soon. It's really awkward when we're sitting here and we're, we're, we're doing a lot of the bottling, uh, but we can't actually talk about too much of the product. Um, the 1910, because I can say that, because, you know, you can see it on the label. Um, so it's a very, uh, very fine whiskey is, is the subtitle name of that one. Because um, again, they always you know have that nice. Uh, so the 1920, the prohibition style, the 1870, the original batch, the 1897, the bottle and bond. Well, the 1910, the very fine whiskey. Uh, there's going to be a great story behind that one when, when we do uh, get a chance to be able to tell it. So we're very much looking forward to doing that. And fortunately, those boxes were all sealed up and shrink wrapped, so we couldn't get a good look at the labels to give a, a clue as to what that whiskey might be. So we'll we'll wait until the actual reveal for that. You'll have a you'll have a chance because we're bottling on the bottling line. So you get your you get your camera. We'll we'll get that. We'll see. You'll, you'll see. So we're walking past the lab now. So yes, this is our our distillation lab. Uh, we're able to run our entire still because again that full functioning distillery. So we get to talk about the glories of a copper still. Um, a lot of our guests, you know, they've they've been on the bourbon trail. They've been able to see. Um, those wonderful uh, copper pot stills out at Woodford Reserve. Um, so now that we get to see, you know, what a copper column still is like, the differences there of how we're using gravity um, with the mash and letting it go down and the steam come up uh, and the separation there, and to be able to tell the entire distillation process um, and just be able to share the bourbon experience with guests. And you pointed out that you don't do mashing here, but you do coopering. Yes. which is really sort of that first step in making whiskey. Yeah, so uh, this is one thing that we're really, really proud of. You can hear the, uh, the hammers going off in the back. Um, but, yeah, no, we are, uh, with Brown Foreman, we're the only company that makes our own barrels, something that we're, we take a lot of pride in. Uh, we look at the, uh, the barrel as a key ingredient. You know, 100% of the color, 50 to 70% of that flavor is going to come from the barrel. So we always want to put it in something uh, that we trust, that we know has been made uh, with quality. Uh, and consistency, just like Old Forester. Um, so yeah, we're raising um, a barrel. Uh, now we do have two other main cooperages, one out by our uh, local uh, airport here in Louisville, and then there's the other one down uh, close to Decatur, Alabama. Um, that's the Jack Daniels Cooper, just uh, one of the newer cooperages. And that's the one that supplies barrels primarily for the folks in Lynchburg, yes. for your colleagues. But uh, we have been to the Brown Foreman Cooperage down by the airport. Yeah. in the past and that one supplies everything for you guys here at old forester also for woodford reserve yeah. early times in the rest of the company now yeah. right and 90 percent of that is still going to jack daniels so we're still only getting a little bit but a, it's, a, it's a good amount so they're raising barrels uh, every 30 seconds there because they're making about three thousand barrels a day there um, we're doing uh, 14, 15, uh, sometimes even 16, depending on how Josh is feeling. Uh, we have two Coopers here. We have Josh and Zach, uh, and they're doing the entire process. Um, so we're doing it from start to finish. Uh, we're raising the barrels. It's going to take 29 to 31 staves, of course, to raise that barrel. We talk about how we get our wood, where we get our wood. So we use American white oak, um, you know, the industry standard. And we get it from 13 different states all across uh, the Appalachian Mountains, down in the Ozarks, and even up in northern Minnesota. But one thing that's really, really nice uh, is we get to see, of course, the raising of the barrel. We get to see the windlass that creates the shape. Um, we even show our proprietary toaster, so that's something that when you guys did tour it, you weren't able to see. Right. We never saw the toasting, but you also char them here, too. Exactly. So we char it. So each uh, tour, when you are on here from uh, Tuesday to Saturday, we don't have production running on Sunday and Monday. Um, but Tuesday to Saturday, uh, one person in a group will be able to press a button and actually char a barrel. It's a 30-second process, and we get to light something on fire. So it's something that's really exciting uh, for every tour. And Josh is over here hammering on uh, the rivets, hammering the rivets into a uh, hoop, it looks like. Or no. So what it looks like he's doing... 
doing is that he's using... Well, um, let's ask Zach. What are you doing here? Well, I have a rough joint on this barrel, so I'm, I'm putting some cedar wedges on either side of that joint to force the wood together to seal up that leak. Because you can't obviously use glues or sealants on these. That is correct. All held together by pressure. So this cedar is uh, is sensory neutral. It'll swell up with when the whiskey hits the wood, and it's going to prevent this barrel from leaking. Did you ever imagine when you started that you were going to become a uh, stop on a tour? <laughs> I, I couldn't have dreamed of the what I'm doing now, yeah, for sure. How many barrels can you do a day here? Uh, me personally? Uh, as, as a team, we're putting about 14 through a day. So pretty small scale. Can you meet this distillery's demands for barrels, or do you still have to get some over from the big cooperage? We, we have exceeded the demand, so we're sending some of our barrels over to Shively, where they're filling it with some of the big production batches of whiskey. So you're outstripping what they expected after just three or four months now, right? You could say that. Yeah. That's one way of putting it. <laughs> time to put in for a raise, I think, at the review time. Uh, this is the third one I've asked for, so yeah. We're on. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Zach's working in the center in the repair shop area, and it's all the stations of the cooperage are located all around this one central workshop, and you really can do everything in here, right? Yeah, no, so we're, we're doing every um, possible thing. Uh, one thing that we do get delivered is the, uh, the barrel heads, because those two are charred. But that's the only thing really, that, as far as the cooperage goes, that we have to, to bring in from our main cooperage. And those require a completely separate process than assembling and raising a barrel with staves. So it makes sense to have to, uh, it, you would have to add a whole second charring station and a second assembly line to put those together because those are all done by separate coopers than the guys who raise the barrels. Yeah, I mean, as far as the, uh, the tour goes out there, I mean, they have very specialized locations of these people are in charge of working the, uh, the hooper. Uh, these people are in charge of raising barrels. Whereas here, our guys, we are all, we're doing everything. So we're leading them uh, through the entire process. Um, so Zach here, he knows how to go from start to finish, how to make a barrel. As we're walking out of the cooperage, everybody I know that works as a cooper is going to scream when they hear this. But Zach's only been doing this for a few days, right? Uh, in fairness, it's two weeks. It was a nice fortnight, uh, you know. But let's explain this because you're rotating people around within the distillery, right? Yeah, so we find it very important uh, as far as production goes is that we all know different places. Uh, so Zach was actually working the still. He was uh, working in the distillation process um, for the first three months, uh, and now he's cross-training in the cooperage. But in fairness to all our, our wonderful coopers out there, our process is really, it's, it's a very automated. Um, one of the main things that, that isn't automated is, is the raising of the barrel. Um, and Zach's still taking a while to, to raise his barrels. I mean, he's probably going to do a barrel every two minutes compared to 30 seconds. Um, so he's taking his time there. But after that, it really gets a, a very, very automated. It's still an art form. And Zach would probably not say he is a master cooper. But he knows enough to fix a leak. He does indeed. He does indeed. So one thing that's really nice walking into maturation is this hallway that we're in. Uh, if you notice, it's the same char that is on our barrel. So it's almost as if you are in a barrel. Um, this is all American white oak. So, I mean, we are in a barrel. Um, and it's right before we go into the maturation warehouse. But before we open that door, there are cutouts, letters and words cut out into the wood with whiskey colored lights behind it that read off some of the tasting notes that you're going to find in your bourbons things like oak and spiced fruit uh, nuts vanilla coffee notes things like that to sort of uh, give people a sense of what they're about to see as we go into a very elaborate maturation warehouse very elaborate uh, so what's really nice is the fact that we're entering in oh, as the door refuses to shut We should get Zach and his plane over here to yeah, scrape yeah, the floor a little bit. Get it down. Um, but we're entering in on the third floor. So it's a catwalk. So we're actually going from the third floor down to the second. Uh, one thing that you'll notice uh, when you are walking through here is it's 90 degrees outside right now. Uh, not very September-like weather. Um, but in here, it's really comfortable. And that's because we're doing something uh, we've never done before. And this is all climate-controlled. 
So it's not heat cycling. It's, it's always going to be this constant uh, around 70 degrees the entire time. And let's explain the heat cycling because Brown Foreman is one of the few bourbon distillers that heat cycles the regular maturation warehouses between hot and cold. Yeah, so uh, with heat cycling, it's producing uh, synthetic seasons. Um, so during the winter months, uh, we're able to uh, heat up our warehouses uh, to 90, 95 degrees and create uh, a little extra season. Because during the winter wintertime, uh, the maturation process is kind of put on a hiatus. The bourbon is being constructed out of those staves, and then it just sits there because it's not hot enough for it to go back in. And we just choose to, uh, to go with the heat cycling because it gets us a little bit more um, maturing of our bourbon uh, throughout the time period. And we're walking down this catwalk, and it gets maybe just a touch more aromatic. The smells, as you uh, go down here, you're picking up more of the, uh, the whiskey smell as we get down inside these barrels. When will it, we actually see whiskey from this coming out? It's going to be at least a few years, I would assume. Uh, very much so. Um, not sure if it's just going to be four years, probably a little longer. We're going to have the ability to have around 900 barrels uh, in this facility. We're doing 150 barrels a year, though, here uh, as far as storing, just so that when we do go ahead and start pulling, we will have a nice rotation going. Um, so it's not, you're not going to be able to come in here in the first year and see it all the way full. Um, that's going to be something that's coming uh, down the pipeline uh, a little longer. What we did just walk past, though, is our, our single barrel uh, trough. Um, we are actually doing a single barrel program here at the distillery now. Um, so whenever you come in to buy a barrel, uh, you will actually have your tasting out here in the maturation warehouse. Uh, we have a table and a, on a platform set up um, over there, uh, and we're able to actually have that here. And then when is ready to be bottled we actually do it over here we have this trough and i think that we have maybe we maybe have some fresh ones in here i'm not sure oh no we don't nope it's empty it is empty so whenever there is uh, a newly uh, dropped uh, bourbon you can have some of the bungs uh will still have a lot of the bourbon and some wonderful wonderful rich smell there's a basket there with uh, a bunch of splintered bungs that have been pulled out and split as bungs tend to do over time because they are not the same hardwood as the barrels, which are white oak. William has pushed the button so we can exit, and I hear a still. No, you hear a bottling line. Ah. So we are going to be able to see that elusive last Whiskey Row series, 1910, being bottled. So this is our Ferrari, as it were. Uh, it's an MBF bottling line uh, made out of uh, in Parma, Italy. Uh, so it's kind of a Ferrari. Uh, it looks really, really fancy and sophisticated, and, and in a lot of ways it is. But it is not as fast as one would think. Um, more like a Pinto than a Ferrari. Uh, we're only doing 10 bottles a minute here. And the reason why we do that is so that you can see the entire process in a slowed-down version, very up close. Whereas other facilities... They're doing the majority of their packaging, so they can't go slow. Uh, and they're not opening it up to tourists on their main bottling lines. Exactly. Uh, so this is usually uh, for single barrel. Right now we are doing the 1910, and we will continue uh, to be the only produ uh, bottlers of 1910. Uh, a couple, like last month, uh, we did birthday bourbon. So we can actually do the conversion on the line to bottle every expression of Old Forest including the president's choice that will be available primarily here. Yeah, so uh, we actually just had the release uh, today. I left work last night uh, around 6.30 uh, in the evening, and there were already people in line for, for the, uh, the president's choice release. Hopefully, we'll be able to see uh, this wonderful new label that, uh, that we have here. And there it is, Old Forester 1910, and that back does say Old Fine Whiskey. Old Fine Whiskey. There's a separate conveyor that brings the boxes down from up above, slides them down on a uh, ramp here so that uh, the guys can put them six to a box with all the hang tags and everything so they're ready to go to retailers. 
and uh, they'll go from here to uh, distributors around the country, right? Yep. So um, 1910 will be available uh, everywhere um, eventually, and I believe... I don't know if the release date's been made public yet, so I don't know as far as why, if I'm allowed to say exactly when uh, to be expecting it, um, but soon. Uh, it's safe to say they're coming, they're on the way, let's put it that way, if they're being put into boxes. If, if, we're, if we're bottling it, it's being put into cases, one would think it's coming around the corner. And uh, we are now walking past another set of these uh, Raymond Lowy decanters, right? Yeah, so Raymond Lowy, um, one of the great glass artists and designers of the industrial age, uh, he did a lot of work in the Art Deco period and with uh, General Motors and a lot of different logos. He was really, he gets a lot of credit for being really one of these legends in what we call today industrial design. The guys that design the iPhones and stuff that we all carry owe a lot to Raymond Lowy. True. Very, very true. Uh, As I tell our guest, uh, Raymond is one of those guys that you've definitely seen his work, but you've probably never heard his name. We're very fortunate to have a lot of the decanters. Other things that he's worked on, uh, he worked on the the Exxon logo, uh, the Shell logo, the Greyhound logo, the U.S. Postal Service logo, and even our Brown Foreman logo. He designed that as well. So uh, very, very excited and honored to be able to share our, uh, our history with uh, our wonderful holiday decanters that we were actually the first ones to develop. So first bottled bourbon, first holiday decanters. Uh, Old Forster has a thing for making some bottles. And back in the day before this opened, these would have been on display at Brown Foreman's corporate headquarters a couple of miles from here, perhaps, but the public would never have seen these. Yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, there is so much over there on our main campus uh, that we're not able to show. And that was one problem that we had with all this old Forester stuff, uh, is that we have so much history with this brand. I mean, it was created back in 1870, the first brand of Brown Foreman. So to finally have this home place that we can show off all this history uh, is, is something that we're very, very excited to be able to share, to get more people uh, from outside the state of Kentucky who, in the state of Kentucky, we all know Old Forester, we all love Old Forester, but outside we want to be able to share that, um, that love with other people. We are taking the trip a lot out of sequence here because we're now in the tasting rooms or next to the tasting rooms where there's two of them so that you can set one up for the next group while you bring folks in for their tasting. You can set up for the next one because you're running these tours every 15 minutes. Yeah, so uh, running tours every 15 minutes, we're able to uh, to set up a tasting room. Uh, we're doing about 18 people uh, on a tour. Sometimes we can, we can bump that up. Uh, it gets a little busy on uh, Saturdays, so... Maybe even see uh, 20 people in there. But the one thing that's wonderful is we always have something new in the, uh, the tasting room. Old Forster has so many different expressions, so we're all the time switching out the tasting room expressions. So right now, I like to say it's our spicy lineup. It's uh, the 86, the Statesman, and the 1897 Bottle and Bond, uh, which personally, my favorite for this time of year. Uh, I love it. Uh, it has almost that rye taste to it, the, the pepper uh, in there. Uh, great for the cool months, even though right now it's, it's not really that cool for us. So uh, looking forward to uh, when it gets nice and cool and I can sit out on the front porch and have some uh, 1897. So there's only one thing we've not talked about or seen yet, the still. Exactly. And so let's go over that way now because when you turn around and look through the windows behind the bottling line, uh, there it is. Yeah, so it is... Uh, nice and view uh, through, through the uh, the glass windows here. As I said before, it's it's Vendome, uh, makers of amazing sills, 44 feet tall, uh, 24 inches in diameter, uh, made just down the street. It actually came in uh, one piece uh, when we delivered it, uh, so we had a massive crane uh, and dropped it through the ceiling. Uh, so it's been here for a while. Uh, and watch the building really grow around it. Um, but it's the heart and soul of this distillery. The piping uh, for this still runs throughout the entire building and almost as if veins, and this truly is the heart. Because um, it's going all the way down to the sub-basement, but our spirit safes are up by the lab, so it has to be pumped all the way back up to the third floor. Uh, the same way with our low wine condensers, our high wine condensers are over here. The doubler is down below us. Um, we're actually on the second floor mezzanine right now. Uh, with our lovely uh, stairway to heaven, uh, as it were. 
uh, going up to the still. And let's put this in perspective, because since this is radio and a podcast, you can't see this. But I can look essentially to the one wall to my left, that's one wall of the distillery and complex, and look to the right and see the other wall. And really, you're lucky if there's about 50 feet there. What you guys have done is something similar to what Heaven Hill did down the street at the Evan Williams Bourbon Experience. You guys managed to cram an entire distillery into essentially a 50-foot wide building that goes back about 100 feet. True. Uh, I'm always amazed at just how much uh, the use of space has come into play uh, when we first got here. Um, To see the fact that we have fermentation, distillation, a cooperage, and a bottling line all in this very simple confines, and even an event space up on the fourth floor. It's just amazing to be able to see it all come together and see the still at the very center uh, of it. This this atrium, it's it's wonderful. Whenever uh, you have any kind of cloud cover, the lighting changes. It's always different whenever you walk into here. We are looking at a glass ceiling, by the way. Uh, They did not brick it up after the still went in, so there's a glass atrium here, and the still goes almost all the way up, and it's got to be about the quietest still I've ever heard because I don't hear anything running, or are we distilling right now? We're not distilling right now, and even when we are, it's not that loud. We do have a, a sight glass, so you'll be able to see uh, that mash uh, going in and out. Uh, we clear off the, uh, the lower two uh, sight glasses as well. Uh, and then down below us, that doubler, uh, we have windows into the doubler, so you can see the doubler going when it's going. Uh, but right now, we don't have any distillation running. It's a Friday afternoon, and everything's been distilled for the week. Yeah. Uh, and, and this may be about as close as a civilian can get to one of these stills. Because, yes, there's half-inch thick plexiglass that's about six and a half feet tall around the still. But that plexiglass is only about a foot and a half or so from the still. So you can actually get right up close to this thing, close enough to read the serial number on the Vendome plate. Yeah, so, I mean, we want this to be inviting. We want this to be uh, really an experience that you can feel like you've learned the entire process that you've really seen up close. Uh, that's why you see so much glass uh, in this distillery. It's, it's very open. It's very inviting. It's very welcoming. Uh, and that's what we want you to be able to fill. We want you to be able to come in and ask any kind of question um, that you have. And even if our tour guides don't have the answer, we're going to be trying to find that answer for you uh, and getting it to you. So to be able to, to come very close to the entire still, to get that picture at the very end, always remember to use the panoramic feature on your iPhone to get the entire still. Uh, That's the pro tip of the day. Um, So many people (laughs) trying to get down on their knees, trying to get that. Because, I mean, 44 feet tall, it's very, very tall. You guys can't see it, um, but it's very tall. So pro tip, use the panoramic feature. As much whiskey as you guys are making, this will not obviously meet the entire demand for Old Forester worldwide, but it's a start. It is, uh, and that's something that we're always very clear with is that our main production facility out in Shiloh, they're still going to be the main production facility. But we're doing everything that they do out there right here. It's just a smaller scale. So our fermentation tanks, they're 4,500 gallons. The one out there, they're 40,000 gallons. Gives you an idea of the kind of scale that we're working with here. But it's still going to be the same juice. Uh, it's still going to be that same quality and that same consistency that George Garvin Brown always wanted for Old Forester. Thanks to Old Forester's William Hogg for taking us on a tour of the Old Forester Distillery. And, by the way, that job rotation program he told us about, well, he's waiting for his chance to run the stills and raise some barrels. That's Whiskey Cast In-Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla single malt. Look for this year's annual release of the Cask Strength Lagavulin 12-Year-Old, It's part of the annual Classic Malt's special releases, and it's on its way to a whiskey shop near you. Find out more at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Let's start off with one of Diageo's attempts to make Mortlock fans happy. After the 2014 relaunch of Mortlock as a single malt, that left some of the distillery's fans frustrated. The new 20-year-old Mortlock is named Cowie's Blue Seal after one of the distillery's original bottlings a century or so ago. 
It's matured in American Oak X Sherry casks and bottled at 43.4% ABV. The nose has notes of dark fruits, oak tannins, and hints of spice with a nice oakiness. The taste starts off nice and gentle, followed by a buildup of peppercorns along with touches of honey and toffee. The classic Mortlock meatiness is there, but it's in balance with the lighter notes. And the finish is long, dry, with just a touch of oak. I didn't have a problem with the previous Mortlock range, but I like this one. I'm scoring the Mortlock 20-year-old Cowie's Blue Seal, a 93, and I'll have my tasting notes for the 12- and 16-year-old versions soon at WhiskeyCast.com. Last month, I mentioned Shelter Point Distillery's new double-barreled Canadian single malt during the news and received a sample from Vancouver Island the other day. This one is finished in French oak and bottled at 50% ABV. The nose is aromatic with dark fruits, oak tannins, and touches of baking spices and cedar. The taste is thick and dry at first with a good buildup of white pepper spice that doesn't overpower notes of oak tannins, honey, plums, and raisins underneath. The finish is long and dry with a touch of oak. I'm scoring the Shelter Point Double Barreled Single Malt a 91. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, our tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, family-owned from the start, and proud to work with other family-owned companies on the Grain to Glass Project. They're working with Beck's Hybrid and Peterson Farms to find unique seeds, grow them, and then distill them into a special whiskey. Follow the project at heavenhilldistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. West Virginia's Smooth Ambler Distillery made a big change to its contradiction blended bourbon a couple of months ago, lowering the bottling strength from the original 50% ABV down to 46%. I reviewed that original version back in 2015, but with the change in bottling strength, it's worth taking a second look at Contradiction. I received a sample of the new version recently, and the nose still has a good balance of spices and sweet notes with oak, honey, clove, allspice, brown sugar, and just a hint of cocoa. The taste starts off sweet and soft at first, with honey and molasses notes. Then spicy notes of clove and allspice start to build up gradually, while still allowing the sweeter notes underneath to shine. The balance is a bit better than the original, in this case. And the finish, it's long and sweet with lingering spices and just a touch of oak. This is one of the rare cases where lowering the bottling strength a bit resulted in an improved whiskey. I scored the original contradiction an 89 back in 2015, but I'm scoring the new 46% ABV version a 91. And finally, Appalachian Gap Distillery in Middlebury, Vermont, makes its Ridge Line Vermont whiskey from a mash bill of corn, rye, and barley, but matures it in a combination of new and used oak barrels, which is why they refer to it as a Vermont whiskey. It's bottled at 49% ABV. The nose is aromatic and sweet, with hints of maple, honey, vanilla, brown sugar, and just a touch of oak. The taste has good spices with black pepper and just a hint of clove that are balanced nicely by honey, vanilla, and caramel notes. The finish is long with spices that stick around for a while and hints of sweetness in the background. I'm scoring the Ridgeline Vermont Whiskey, an 88. I'm adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,300 different whiskeys from around the world. You'll find it at whiskeycast.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreast Lestow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Lestow. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Lestow edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that would be better described as a final act. 
Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice, brought to you by Lot 40. Got this comment after posting our news story Saturday on the Sotheby's auction and that 1926 Macallan at the WhiskeyCast website. Whiskey Rye at Drams of Whiskey on Twitter tweeted this. Wow, surprised this went for so much less than the previous bottle with a winged money emoji. Well, I'm not completely surprised by the results. If you look closely at the Sotheby's description of the bottle on their website, it mentions that there was a slightly soiled label, along with a small piece missing out of the capsule on the top of the bottle, and the lid of the display case had been repaired. That might have scared off some of the potential bidders, who would settle for nothing less than a mint condition bottle to drop a million dollars on. This week, we've been running a poll on Twitter asking how many bottles of whiskey you have at home. And we received almost 1,100 responses. 29% of those responding have 10 or fewer bottles. 25% have between 11 and 30, while 22% have 31 to 50 bottles. The other 24%, well, not nearly enough bottles. I caught a lot of grief for not including a more than 50 option, but Twitter only lets you have four choices in a poll. Some of the responses, Bay Cool lives in Scotland. I'm not even counting in our house. Now, I've got to note that Faye's husband is Glen Murray Distillery Manager Graham Cool, so I told her she has to answer based on the number of non-Glen Murray whiskeys in the house. Her response, three laughing emojis. At Reisky Samples on Twitter, not nearly enough will always be the right answer to that question. And Lauren Mulder tweeted this, I do not count my bottles, so when asked by my wife, I can truthfully answer that I do not know. I will take the fifth on your quiz, but north of a bunch. Sue Williams at Real Sue Williams tweeted this, Next question. How many bottles do you return for recycling at a time? And part B would be, at which number do you get embarrassed? Sue, that's a great question, especially if you have curbside recycling and your neighbors can see into your cans full of empty bottles. Fortunately, our neighbors aren't into gossip, but we have turned Sue's idea into our new poll question. You'll find it on our Twitter timeline, and I'll have the results on an upcoming episode. Meanwhile, if you have something else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always track us down online. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast, and you can also use the Your Voice page at WhiskeyCast.com, or you can just email us. The address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Your Voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our look at the science, history, and other stuff that make whiskey unique. It's presented by Writer's Tears. During our Old Forester tour earlier in the show, we mentioned the single-barrel dumping station and a basket full of pieces of old bungs the wooden plugs that are used to seal the bunghole in a barrel. Of course, those barrels are made out of oak, but the bungs? No. They're usually made out of poplar or another softwood. The reason? Those softer woods swell more when they're wet, and that creates a tighter seal that keeps whiskey from leaking out of a barrel. If they did use oak, the bung would swell just a little bit when it gets wet, but not enough to hold it firmly in place. The oak in the staves swells just enough to prevent almost all leaks between the staves, but using a softer wood ensures that bungs will stay in place, even when a barrel is being rolled around. If you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey combining single malt and single pot still. 
first fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this episode of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. And that's also where you'll find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast brought to you by the Whiskey Exchange, along with the latest whiskey news, events, photos, and a whole lot more. Please take a minute this week and help a friend discover Whiskey Cast, as well as other podcasts out there. There's a whole world of content, but many people don't quite know how to find it. So you can show them how to use the podcast app on their phone or tablet to find Whiskey Cast and subscribe for free. Remember, friends don't let friends miss out on podcasts. Our Cask Strength conversation continues all week long on social media. Look for us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. Or if you're not the social media type, you can always email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. We'd love to hear from you. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavor of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no red breast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you twice each week, usually from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.